So Bruce is going to take this prayer thing seriously. And of course, if you're going to take it seriously, the first thing you must do is get yourself organized, right? I mean, you got to have a system for putting the prayers in order and getting them put out to people and all that kind of good stuff. And, and you know what? Maybe that's a good thing and that's not such a good thing. Because in his rush to get organized, what did he forget to do? He didn't pray. He, he, he didn't get around to He was just so in a hurry to get things in a process where it could be consumed that you know what? He forgot that they aren't here to be consumed, publicized, and advertised. Requests were meant to be prayed for. And you know what? I think as a church, sometimes we do the same thing. I mean, we produce lists, and, and we've put a few symbols out. We've got a wall downstairs and a well up here, and we've got a, peacekeeper's bo- a prayer keeper's box over here, and we've got all of these things that, that we're trying to use to get our prayers organized. And in the past, we've read them from the pulpit, and then we put them out in emails, and we put them on the back of the bulletin. But, but you do get it. If we fail to actually pray for them, um, this isn't an advertisement game. The idea is that when you see the requests, you stop and you pray for them. And, and we begin to think about that, and, um, and we say, well, but, but we have to wait till we get together to pray. Well, um, here's a question for you. Is the only time you eat when the church plans a fellowship meal? Man, that would be a great diet plan, wouldn't it? If I only ate whenever we were going to do a church, think all the weight I could lose. But no, how often do you eat? Most of us daily. Most of us a few times a day. Um, because, because we don't wait for the church to feed us. Um, it is the only time you worship on Sundays at 1030 a.m.? Man, I hope not. I don't hope we come in here in the morning and say, okay, this is my worship time. Go. And then when I'm all done, I put it away and I go home and I, and I don't have anything else to do with worship. I hope not. That's not the way it was supposed to work. Um, is the only time you open God's word during Sunday school or corporate study? Man, I hope not. I hope that, that there's a process in your life that you put in place where you read God's word on a regular basis. And maybe you even have a few other authors that you like to read books about the Bible to learn some other things so you can get other people's perspective. I hope there's more to your, to your life than just you come here and you, and you listen to a lesson or a sermon and you go home and that's all you've done for it. And you do understand prayer should fit in that same category. Um, if prayer becomes nothing more than some prepackaged church ministry with a label stuck on it, then we feel that we feel some obligation to attend, then we're solving the wrong problem. Because if we're just going to create a prayer ministry for the sake of having something we can post on our website to say we have a prayer ministry, if all we're trying to do is fill a bulletin board downstairs or the back of a piece of paper that says prayer list on it, or have something to take up space in the bulletin because we don't have any room to put in, if that's the purpose, then we've missed the point. You see, I'm not here to advertise requests. I'm here to teach you to pray. And in case you missed the notice, I can't teach you to pray unless I can first teach you to pray. The mechanics aren't the most important part. It's the desire to get yourself in front of God and pray. The lists, the post-its, the file cabinets... That's just the content that we should be taking to God. But just remember, that isn't prayer. So um, we're going to continue our march through what I call the model prayer. Many call it the Lord's Prayer. Um, It reads this way from Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Then this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So we started our look into this prayer last week with our our Father in heaven, and we talked about the relationship that we're supposed to have with God, that we're not going to Santa and we're not going to a genie. We're going to our Father who desires to have a relationship with us. And so so that was the whole point behind that. And so now we're going to get into the part of prayer that we'd like, sort of. It's the part where we get to ask God for stuff. 
where we're going to talk about asking God for things. And Jesus gives us four categories that we're going to explore over the next four weeks. That our prayer life, that as you're asking God for things, this is how you can put those things into kind of an outline. Outlines are good. Again, I'm not against organization. An organized prayer is a good thing. And, well, he starts off with um, this phrase. Man, I wish he would have started off with give us our day, our daily bread. Um, that would have been a lot easier to do, but that's not where he started. He started with this idea of your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that in itself is an interesting phrase because the first thing we want to know is why start here with prayer? I mean, really? I mean, it's such a weird statement to make. Um, as a matter of fact, what exactly are we praying for here? I mean, are we really asking for Jesus to bring heaven right here on earth? Is that the goal, that we're praying for some kind of utopia or paradise here on this planet? Um, it has to back something that we seek. I mean, isn't that what prayer is for? We're asking God. This is the asking section. So this is something that we're seeking when we talk about this phrase. And it has to be something that is beneficial, correct? I mean, God, Jesus talked about the idea of prayer so that God can, can, can give us good gifts. So this is something that, that when I seek it, it's something that's supposed to be, be, be beneficial, if not for my life, maybe for the church. And so I want to understand when I read that phrase, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does that mean? And to appreciate that, we got to look into the two big topics that are there. What is the kingdom? And oh, here's the great question. What is God's will? Now, those are two big topics. You're thinking there's no way on earth that you can cover that in one sermon. Watch me. Because it's not as complicated as we make it. It really isn't. When you boil what this all means down to its really bare points, it isn't as complicated. You see, kingdom of heaven is not a synonym for heaven. So when Jesus says heaven on earth, he isn't talking about a place. He's talking about something different. He's saying make earth heaven-like, but he's not necessarily saying make it utopia, make it, you know, streets of gold. Wouldn't that be cool if Stanton had streets of gold? I mean, that would be a good tourist attraction, wouldn't it? Or, or a crystal sea. That would, be that would be great, but he's not asking for that. Um, personally, I don't think we're talking about a kingdom that is in a physical sense. The disciples got caught in this trap a whole bunch. Um, they were always asking Jesus, now, Jesus, now can we have the kingdom? Now are we going to get our thrones? Now are we going to get what we want? Now are we going to be in charge? And Jesus kind of like, just calm down. The kingdom's on my time frame. And I don't think we're talking about when Jesus says kingdom come on heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. I don't think we're talking about a physical kingdom that we're looking for. Um, a kingdom, just so you know, as Webster defines it, is a country, a state, or a territory ruled by a king or a queen. And by the way, I know, I haven't even gotten to the first blank yet. People are like, when do I start filling in? You'll get, we'll get there in just a second. Um, the idea of a kingdom is it's something that is united, but it's united by the idea of a king or a queen. It's a territory. And, well, when we begin looking at and looking for the kingdom of heaven, it, it's not much different. Um, kingdom of heaven, God is the ruler. According to Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. So, so you understand in this kingdom, Jesus is the king. Not me, not you, not the church, not the elders. Okay, there is but one king in a kingdom, and for our kingdom, it's Jesus. So the other thing we find out is when we begin to look at this idea of kingdom, um, it's centered around the idea of repentance. Now, we've talked about that concept quite a bit, um, that we're supposed to be a repentant people. And believe it or not, the message of the kingdom started this way. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, from that time on, so that means from the point that this first started all the way through, Jesus began to preach, repent. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, pay close attention. It didn't say the kingdom of heaven is here. The word rhymes with here, but it isn't here. It says the kingdom of heaven is close. It's come near. 
It's right there. So whatever we're looking for, even Jesus said, it's something that is still a little ways out, but it'll be here very shortly. So finding the kingdom of heaven, Jesus then proceeds to tell a bunch of parables. Um, if you start leafing through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you start looking for those sections that say parables, um, you're going to see many of them start off with, and the kingdom of heaven is like, or the kingdom of God is like. And, and that goes on and on and on. And then when you start reading those, Jesus starts giving us clues about what this kingdom is supposed to look like. And it's kind of a fun thing if you like to do, to do scavenger hunts. Um, this is a cool thing you begin to look at because what you find out about the kingdom gives you a different perspective. Um, here's the first thing it tells us. Um, finding the way of the kingdom is more valuable than all of your possessions combined. So that means if I take everything I own and I sold every bit of it and piled all the money into the middle, of, both dollars, and put it in the middle, of the, in the middle of the stage here and said, here's the value of everything I own, it wouldn't even make a down payment on the kingdom. It wouldn't, get you, it wouldn't get you a seat on the train to go by and just look at it. Because the kingdom itself is more valuable than anything that you own. For a time, according to Jesus, both believers and unbelievers are in the kingdom. Huh? Well, yeah. We have the parable of the weeds and the weeds, and the weeds are allowed to grow right beside the wheat. And we have, the, we have the parable of the net, where the fish, where the good fish and the bad fish are all in the same net. And Jesus says, and he starts off those, both of those parables, and it says, and this is what the kingdom is going to be like. See, we get this idea that the kingdom of heaven is all about, well, all the Christians are here, all the good people are here, and all the bad people are out there somewhere. The kingdom of heaven encompasses more than just what we would consider a believer. It says, for a time, it will contain both equally. As a matter of fact, the weeds and the wheat parable, the weeds grow right along beside the wheat, and as they go out and look at them, they can't really tell one from the other. And so this is what the kingdom is going to look like. But at some point, the unbelievers will be separated out. So as you read through the parables, this mingling together doesn't last forever. There is going to be a time when they look at it and say, well, now we're going to say, here's the wheat and here's the weeds, and we're going to separate things out. I don't think we're to that point yet. Sometimes we try. We try very hard. Well, let's go ahead and separate it now. Not my job to separate. You know what? I can't tell a weed from a wheat. Not my job. Somebody else's job, and I'm glad to let them go do it. Um, but there will be a point in time when there will be a separation. Here's an interesting thing maybe you didn't know about the kingdom. It would start out small. This is from the parable of the mustard seed, but would grow huge. So when this kingdom started, it would be a teeny tiny little thing. As a matter of fact, it said the mustard seed was the smallest seed that there was. So it's this little bitty tiny seed. But when it's grown and it's planted and it's nurtured, it would grow into something huge. Um, it values humility over status. Jesus kept telling the disciples, don't worry about your place. Don't worry about your seat. Don't worry about whether or not you're going to rule over a bunch. Worry about what? Becoming a servant, right? Humble yourself. He tells us that in this kingdom, all are invited. And those that don't, and those, and those that don't choose, I wrote that wrong. All are invited to come, and those that don't come are without excuse. So, so the invitation is open, and everybody can be a part of the kingdom. And if you choose not to, then you understand it was your choice. And at some point, when we get to the end of it all, that's it. You don't get to make an excuse about why you, why you didn't get to come. Because the invitation is out there for every single person. So when we begin to look at and we assemble all of these pieces, um, this is the closest I can come to helping you understand what the kingdom is. It's not a place. It's a process. Putting the pieces together and all of the parables and all the things we read about the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven began at Pentecost with the arrival of the Holy Spirit and the beginning of the church. Now, I'm being very careful. I am not saying the church is the kingdom of heaven, but I am telling you, the church is the starting point where the kingdom became here on earth. So where we are today, in the where we are in the body and the kingdom today, we're in kind of a growth mode. So, so the kingdom right now is supposed to be expanding its territory by encouraging those that are lost to establish a relationship with Christ. 
So, so here today in, in 2019, the idea of the kingdom is we are in a growth mode. So it was planted at Pentecost, really small. It's been growing ever since. And then we are still in that mode of growth. So that means since we're in that growth of mode, the church's main objective is to grow the kingdom. That's important for us to note. We are not in the mode of sitting and watching and waiting for the king. We are supposed to be growing the kingdom. We are in a growth mode. That is what Jesus left us here to do when he told us to go into all the world and make disciples. When he told us in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that we're supposed to go into Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, to the other ends of the earth. It means we keep going. When do we stop? When we run out of people. So when everybody on the planet has heard the gospel, we can stop. Until that point, we are still in the growth mode for the kingdom. Now, at some point, the kingdom will enter a time of harvest where those that have placed their faith will continue in that relationship for eternity. So at some point, this growth mode is going to stop and Jesus is going to say, we sung that sing, song, even so come. Jesus is going to come and that's going to be the point at which, okay, now we have the established boundaries of the territory. You understand, the boundaries of the territory Jesus is looking for isn't borders on a map. It's the heart of humanity. He's expanding his kingdom by more hearts bowing their will toward him. You see, the kingdom of heaven is all about the salvation of humanity. That's what we need to remember. And the moment we lose sight of that, then you know what? Everything begins to fall apart like a house of cards. The moment we stop thinking that the whole purpose of the kingdom was to rescue humanity and was, you know, service me, that's what I kind of think the kingdom's supposed to do, right? No. It was designed to be a rescue mission. And so when you signed on board, you signed on to the trauma unit, is what you did. You signed on to go out into the world and find things that are broken and try to help fix them. And not do, just do that, you realize what our mission is, we're supposed to be doing open heart surgery, heart transplants, turning people back toward God. That is what we're supposed to be doing. That's the kingdom. Okay? So if that's the kingdom, what's God's will? Here's the good news. I don't even have to go looking hard for this because Jesus' best friend, Peter, gave it to us perfectly in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. I sure am glad of that word. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Wait a minute. That seems to almost fit right in with the purpose of the kingdom. You see, when we look at this, what is God's will? Well, you have to remember, will is just means it's what I want. Okay? It's, it's what God wants. And what does God want? Well, it says, God's will is that none perish. That's God's will. God's ultimate will for your life has nothing to do with what job you're going to have. God's ultimate will for your life has nothing to do with who you're going to marry, has nothing to do with where you're going to live, it has nothing to do with what kind of car you're going to drive or what kind of toothpaste you're going to use to brush your teeth. That kind of stuff God cares about, but his ultimate will is that you have a relationship with him. Once you have that, you get it. You're living inside of God's will because that is what he wants. He wants everybody to choose a relationship with him. Everybody and anybody. Isn't that what he said in the parable of the banquet? Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. I love that word, compel, because it means anything short of bodily harm. That means technically duct tape would be okay, right? You can get that off without causing bodily harm. But he's talking about this idea that he wants us to go out and compel them to come in. That's his will. We don't have to ask. It's not a big puzzle. Um, he has made promises to those that do, so those that come in and establish a relationship, he's made promises, and we're here today because of those promises. I got up this morning and came to this building because of those promises, because I want to have a relationship with him, but I need to understand as the church, but he is also waiting patiently. God's not done yet, okay? God hasn't finished establishing his territory yet. And so he is waiting patiently to fulfill those promises, hoping others will come. That's what he wants. That's God's will, plain and simple. It's not that complicated. See, the problem is, is we try to make God's will about me. And God's will is about 
the kingdom. Hence the way Jesus starts his prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. In other words, we need to get your kingdom going here on earth. Thy will be done. None perish. Makes perfectly good sense, does it not? When you put the two pieces together and you put all of the pieces of the puzzle together. So um, what are we praying for? Well, let me just tell you what we're not praying for. We are not praying for the speedy return of Jesus. I love that song, Even So Come. There's nothing wrong for looking forward to, to Jesus coming back. But I just want to tell you what is one of the most selfish prayers a Christian can ever pray. God, please come quickly. You know why that's a selfish prayer? Because really what you're saying is, I got mine and I don't care about the person that ain't here yet. Come on back so this can be over for me. We're not praying for that. That's the opposite of what we're praying for. The first thing we should be praying for is more time. And I'm not talking about more time to go do the things that I want. I'm talking about, Jesus, can you just wait one more day? God, can I just have another week or so? There are so many other people out there that I want to share with. There are just so many other people that I know that need to have a relationship with you. God, there's just so many. Can you just wait? Can you give us more time? It's almost like Moses when he was pleading for Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, God, if I can just find anybody, will you wait for them? Here's the funny thing. It says, if you can find one, I'm good with waiting. As long as we can find somebody to share with, last thing we should be asking for is for Jesus to come back. Because you understand once he comes back, that's harvest time, and that means that those people's chances are all over. Now, would you not rather endure a couple more days on this planet going through whatever you're suffering and have somebody else have their relationship established with Christ rather than just go home and sit? See, that's a big deal. We are praying for the, his territory here on earth, right now labeled as the church, to ultimately grow into his kingdom in heaven. So you understand we're the funnel. They establish their relationship here on earth through the ministry of the church so that eventually they will have their relationship in heaven move forward. Maybe you never thought about it that way. We are the only pipe that goes to heaven. You get that, right? We are the only link, the only connection. So literally the church is the representation of heaven on earth because without the church, the message is not going to come clear. Of course, the problem is sometimes with the church, the message isn't all that clear. But this is what we're praying for when we say, Jesus, we'd like you to make heaven on earth. Well, he's going to say, you know what? I can do that. See, the growth is done by praying for his will to be done, and that is none perish. So that means that our biggest prayer request list should be what? People in the hospital? People that are lost. People that, that sit on our shores that are right next to us, that, that live beside us each and every day, and we know they don't have a relationship, and we know if today was that day of harvest, they would be in the not category. They would be the weeds or the bad fish. That's who we're praying for. That is, should be the things that are posted on our wall and stuffed into our well and stuffed into our life. That's the thing that Jesus starts off with, is pray for those that need a kingdom. We are praying for all to come to the banquet. That's plain and simple. I'm praying that everybody has an opportunity to hear. I'm praying that everybody can see. I'm praying that everybody comes to the table. I want everybody to be in the kingdom. I do. If I had my choice, I would literally go out and duct tape. If I thought that would work, we would take that as a ministry. We call it the duct tape ministry. We just go out there and get them and drag them in. But that doesn't have to work. You have to make a choice to be here all we can do is go out there as the people of the kingdom and invite people to come. Of course, you do realize when you invite people to come, that means you have to make it actually appetizing for them to come. That's a big part of this. Um, I want you to notice this is where Jesus started. Remember I told you it would be nice if you started out and give us, our day, our, give us today our daily bread. That's not where he started. He didn't start with the need stuff. He said, you know what? When you're going to go into a real prayer relationship, you're gonna, your heart is going to break for lost people. And this is where you're going to spend the majority of your time because you, when you truly understand what the kingdom is and the fact that this is a forever proposition, then you get it. You get it. 
And those that are outside the kingdom, your heart breaks and weeps for them. And you know what? It'll just trouble your soul. You won't worry about whether or not you don't feel good. You'll worry about, oh my gosh, I've only got a few more days. I don't know when this clock's going to be up, but my neighbor hasn't heard yet. So maybe I better go tell my neighbor. Do you see how this begins to work? See, there is no prayer bigger than this one. This is it. This is Jesus starting off prayer life by defining the mission. And that is we are to literally try to grow the kingdom here on earth so that later on the kingdom is fulfilled afterwards. When we pray, this part of the prayer, what we're really asking for is God give us a chance to make a difference. That's what this is all about. When I pray this prayer, God, I'd like your will to be done. Can you make your kingdom come here on earth? What I'm really saying is, um, God, make me a messenger. Paul in Romans chapter 10, verse 14 says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? That's a good point. How can you pray to somebody you don't believe exists? You know, um, and how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? Well, that makes sense, too. If I've never heard the message, then obviously I'm not going to believe it. Oh, wait a minute. And how can they hear without someone preaching it to them? Well, my, that, that makes a whole bunch of sense, too. For me to hear it, somebody has to tell me, correct? It kind of changes your perspective on this little phrase. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God, your kingdom needs to come here on earth just as it is in heaven. You know what? Jesus said, you betcha. And have I got the people for the job? Because this is what we signed up for. We didn't sign up to organize a bunch of lists. We signed up to reach people. You see, if we are serious about prayer, then we are going to become very, very serious about reaching the lost. So I'm going to need my volunteers. Not have to be the same volunteers. We can have other people, but I, I need two people that want to give me a hand here. Come on down, Sophia. You can do this. Anybody else? Anybody else want to be a helper? Okay, Marty's going to be. Oh, you want to help too, Lee? I can do three people. We can do three. This is what I need you to do. I need you to make sure between the three of y'all, everyone sitting here this morning gets one of these. Start over there. All right. So I would like to tell you. You guys can thank um, our Pokemon Go people for this particular prayer challenge. Um, if you don't know who the Pokemon Go people are, um, we have a thing where somehow this church parking lot ended up on whatever the Pokemon game is, and we would pull up in the parking lot, and about every third day, the parking lot would be crawling with people with their phones walking around doing this. And, and, and what they were doing is they were chasing a Pokemon around our parking lot, um, trying to catch them on his phone. And, and I began to think about prayer challenges, and I thought, you know what? It worked really well for the Pokemon people, so maybe it'll work well for us. So as you're getting your piece of paper, I'm sure you're noticing, man, that looks vaguely familiar. Yeah, um, this is the parking lot. By the way, I do want to let you know I missed one parking lot space. It goes right out here, so if you want to add that one, you may. It goes right out here. So it doesn't show up really good on Google Maps, so when I traced this with Google Maps, that parking space didn't show up, but you could add the one right outside the church. But um, this is the parking spaces, and this is the church. Okay? So now, here's what I want you to do with this piece of paper. And we're starting as soon as you leave the building today. The first thing, by the way, there are 40, counting the one I missed, there are 43 parking spaces. So, starting today when you leave... Take a look at where your car is, and wherever that spot is on the parking list, put an X on that one. We'll talk about that one next week, okay? So put an X, we're not praying for that one, okay? So you put an X wherever your car is parked, you mark that one off. So that means if you brought two cars today, then you get to knock off two spaces. Thank you, Aaliyah. All right, so then here's what I want you to do. I want you to start filling the, oh, Bud didn't get one back there, Sophia. Take Bud one. So, so then, starting space by space, I want you to start putting names to parking lot spaces. Okay? Now, here's the deal. They can be people in the church. They can be neighbors. They can be people that you work with. Okay? 
But here's the, I'm going to tell you, you're going to, if you just do families in the church, you're going to run out of spaces before you run out of, pe- you're going to run out of people before you run out of spaces. So that means you're going to have to basically come up with some people that don't go here to fill in the parking lot. Now, if you happen to know a whole bunch of people and you fill all your spaces up and you're like, I got more people I want to do, well, then, then, then you can just start filling the church up. Feel free. You're welcome to fill the church up, too. I'm okay with that. All right? So, so, so then here's what I want you to do, though. As you're filling... Yes. You may have one, too. There you go. All right. So then as, after you, as you're filling up the spaces, this is what I want you to do. I want you to pray for that person that you wrote into the space. And you think, wait a minute, that space is too small. I can't write that small. That's okay. You can write the names 1 through 42 on the back. That's good. We'll find, there's a way, I'll get yourself a piece of notebook paper. How you do it doesn't matter. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray for the persons that you put in the parking space. Hey, what am I supposed to pray? I don't know. Why did you write them in the space? Maybe you wrote them in the space because you know they're struggling with something. Maybe you wrote them in the space because you'd like to see them here. Maybe you wrote them in the space because they're your next-door neighbor. Maybe you wrote them in the space because you were out of names to write and you just wanted to stick a name there. I don't know. But whatever was your logic for putting them in the space, what I want you to do is I want you to take that, that and just state that back to God. It can go something as simple as this. Hi, God. For Jane Doe, would you please... And then you can just fill in the blank. And all you have to do is do that 42 times. Now... If you look at that, there's a couple ways you can do this. You can do this all in one day, which will probably cost you about an hour of your day. Or there are um, 40, well, 43 now. That messes up my math, but that's okay. There are 43 spaces. So you got, well, no, you can cross one off for yourself. So you still have 42. So if you divide that by seven, that means you only have to pray for six people a day for the next week. That doesn't sound so hard, does it? Six people? That's not difficult at all. Now, here's the thing. I'm not making anybody turn these back in. Okay, we're not going to have a posting next week to see who finished out their map. But remember, the only way I can truly teach you to pray is to teach you to pray. Now, maybe you're sitting here today and, I, and you say, you know, I don't know anybody in this church. That's okay. All I'm asking for is 42 names. I didn't say they had to go to this church. They can be anywhere, anybody. I'm just asking you to pick 42 people this week and pray for them. And if a few of them are lost, awesome. Pray for them. But then as you're praying, you might be careful because as you're praying, it also means that maybe God is leading you. If that name came to your mind and you put them in your parking lot, maybe God is leading you to make sure that at some point their car ends up in the space out there. That's the ultimate goal. Is We're going to begin to pray for people to start coming to God. Notice I didn't say the church. Coming to God by establishing the relationship and we're going to actually pray for them.